This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory. And this lecture will be mostly about groups and their relation to number theory. So what I'm essentially going to do is to go through all the things I've talked about so far and just comment on how they fit into the language of group theory. So let's just recall what a group is. So a group is a set with some sort of binary operation uh, usually denoted by multiplication, so we could write a times b or sometimes a dot b or sometimes just a b if we're feeling lazy or even a plus b. And this has to have the following properties. First of all, there's an identity element. And um, so this is an element such that um, 1 times a is equal to a times 1 is equal to a. Or if you're writing it additively, you would write this as 0 and have 0 plus a equals a plus 0 equals a. Secondly, it has inverses. So this means it's got an inverse a to the minus 1, such that a to the minus 1 times a is equal to 1, which is equal to a to the minus 1 times a. Um, or if you write it additively, this the inverse is minus a, so a plus minus a equals minus a plus a equals 0. And thirdly, it's associative, which just means a times b times c is a times bc. Or additively, a plus b plus c is a plus b plus c. Now, in um, at least in elementary number theory, almost all the groups we look at have an additional property, which is that they're commutative. Um, or sometimes called abelian, named after the mathematician Arbel. Um, and this just says that you can change the order of the multiplication. So we have AB equals BA, or A plus B equals B plus A. So um, let's have some examples of groups. Um, so basic examples, we could have the, the, the group of integers and where the group operation is addition, the usual addition, and, and we have the usual identity is zero, and um, the negation of an element is its inverse. Um, you can do the same thing with the real numbers, again using addition and with the usual with the zero. Or you could have the non-zero real numbers where the, the operation is now multiplication. Um, if you took all real numbers under multiplication, this wouldn't be a group because one of the elements, zero, doesn't have an inverse under multiplication. Um, so in number theory, the most important groups we've had are first of all the integers modulo a number m under addition. And this group is often denoted by z modulo mz. And so here z stands for the integers. This means the integers that are a multiple of m. And if you're quotienting out, it means you're sort of considering anything that's a multiple of m to be essentially 0, which is, of course, just what you do when you work modulo m. Um, so uh, the, the second sort of group we've had is the integers modulo m that are co-prime to m under multiplication and this group is usually denoted by z modulo mz and then we put a star there to mean we're taking the um, elements co-prime to m um, and the point is that the elements co-prime to m all have inverses you remember so this is like solving a b as congruent to one modulo m, which we can solve provided a is co-prime to b. Um, um, next, we um, recall what a subgroup is. So a subgroup is a subset of a group h that's also a group under the same operation. So, so it's a subset plus a group, roughly speaking. So for example, Let's take the group of integers modulo 6. So we can think of this as having five elements, 0 up to 5. And let's look at what possible subgroups there are. Well, we can take the whole group. Um, 
So one obvious subgroup is just the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Next, we could take just the zero element. That forms a group, although obviously not a terribly interesting one. Um, next, we could take the elements 0 and 3, because if we take 3 plus 3, that gives us 0 again. Um, we could also take the element 0, 2 and 4. Um, and th this illustrates a common way of forming a subgroup, which is just to take um, an element and to take all the positive and negative powers of it. Or if we were writing the group under addition, we would take all sums and differences of copies of it. So if we take the element 2, we would take, you know, all multiples of 2, like 2, 4 and 6. Well, 6 is back to 0. Um, and it's not difficult to check. These are the only subgroups of of the group of integers mod 6. Um, now we come to one of the basic theorems of group theory, which is due to Lagrange, which says the order of a subgroup divides the order of a group. So what's the order? Well, the order is just the number of elements. And of course, this only applies in an interesting way to finite groups, because if groups are infinite, then this doesn't really say anything very interesting. Um, and let's call this subgroup H, and let's call the group G, and we'll just have a look at the standard example to remind ourselves. So we take the group of integers under multiplication um, as our group G, so it is elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and we're going to take our subgroup H to be um, three elements, 1, 3, and 9. So you can see 3 times 9 is 27, which is congruent to 1 modulo 13. So this is a little subgroup of order 3. And what we can do is, as well as the subgroup H, we can, we can multiply everything in H by 2. Let's call that 2H. So that's 2, 3, and 18. Well, 18 is 5 modulo 13. So Here's h, it consists of 1, 3, and 9. And here's 2h, which consists of 2, uh, sorry, 6, and 5. And what else? Well, we could look at um, 4h, which is 4, 12, 10. So here we get 4 and 12 and 10. And what's left over? Well, there's 7h, which is 7, 8, 11. So there's 7, 8, 11. And if you look, every element of G is a un is in exactly one of these four cosets of H. Um, and this is what happens in general. So a coset of H is usually denoted by AH. It's the set of all elements A times H1, A, H2, and so on, where H is equal to H1, H2, and so on. And then we notice that any two cosets have the same order. And that's because if you've got two cosets, um, say H and AH, we may as well take one of the cosets to be H. Um, we can map any element H to A times H, and this will give us a map from H to AH. And then we can map it back by um, if we just multiply by the inverse of A, then these two maps are bijections and give a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two cosets. We can also see that two cosets are either the same or disjoint. Um, so um, let's just show that um, two cosets H and AH are either the same or disjoint. Um, so we've got to show that if they've got some element in common, then um, they're actually the same. So um, suppose that some element AH1 is in H. Well, this means AH1 is equal to H2 for some element in H2. So A is equal to H2, H1 to the minus 1, which is also in H. So that means AH is now equal to H because you're just multiplying um, elements of the group H by themselves. And similarly, you can show that if BH and AH have an element in common, then they must be the same. So G is a disjoint 
union of cosets of the same size. So um, the order of any coset, which is just the order of um, H, divides the order of G because G, the order of G is just the order of H times the number of cosets. So if we go back to the example we looked at earlier, we saw that um, this cyclic group of order six has four subgroups and we can see the orders of the subgroup are six, zero, two and three, all of which divide six. And for each of these subgroups, you can see the various cosets. For instance, a coset of this subgroup would be one, three and five. And this subgroup has three cosets um, because we can add one to three and we can also add two to three. Sorry, that should be a four. So um, one very important application of Lagrange's theorem is that the order of any element G in the group G divides the order of the group G. So what's the order of an element? Well, the order of an element is the smallest integer n greater than zero, such that g to the n is equal to one. That's if it exists. If, if no such n exists, we say the um, element has infinite order, but all the groups we're looking at are going to be finite. And you can see the order of an element. Well, let's look at an element g. It says and let's keep multiplying it by itself. So we get g squared g cubed and so on up to g to the n minus 1. And then suppose g to the n is equal to 1. Then we notice that these elements form a subgroup of order n. So the order of the subgroup is the same as the, ele as the order of the, the element g. So the order of g divides the order of the group. So that's Lagrange's theorem. Um, and um, we have two very important corollaries. First of all, we have Fermat's theorem, which says that um, x to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. And for this, we just take the group to be z modulo pz star, which is the integers co-prime to p taken mod p. And the, the order is p minus 1. So and the order of an element divides p minus 1. This means that x to the n equals 1 for some n dividing p minus 1. And by raising this to a sufficiently high power, you see that x to the p minus 1 is also congruent to 1. And of course, we get Euler's theorem in the same way. This just says that x to the phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m whenever m is co-prime to x. And this again follows in much the same way because phi of m is just the order of the group z modulo mz star of integers modulo z up to multiplication. So incidentally, for um, abelian groups, there's, a, there's another slightly shorter proof that a to the order of um, the group g is uh, equal to 1. Here, the absolute value of g is just the order of the group g. And for this, what we do we, we look, look at, at g1, g2, up to gn, where n is the order of g, and g1 up to gn are the elements of uh, g. And you notice that a g1, a g2, and so on are also the elements of g. Um, uh, 
um, because a has an inverse, so you get a one-to-one -one correspondence between g and itself just by multiplying by a. So let's multiply all these together. We see that g1, g2, and so on up to gn is equal to a g1, a g2, up to a g n. And this is just equal to a to the n times g1 up to g n. And by cancelling g1 up to g n, which we can do because they have inverses, we see that 1 is equal to a to the n, where n is the order of g. This proof doesn't work for non-abelian groups, although the result is still true for non-abelian groups, because it turns out that the, the, the proof using cosets works for that. Um, next, we say a group is cyclic. if it has one generator. Well, what does a generator mean? So this means that all elements are powers of the, 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 the element G. So here are some examples of cyclic groups. First of all, the integers is cyclic. Here a generator is one. And you remember um, when we're talking about powers of the generator, that's if a group is written multiplicatively. Here the integers are written additively, so instead of powers we should take multiples of elements, and we see that any element can be written as n times 1 for some n. Similarly, the integers modulo mz is also cyclic, and here we could take a generator to be 1, but we could also take a generator be any element a for a co prime to n because you you know that any element of this group is a multiple of a provided a is co prime to m so this group has phi of m generators i guess i should have said that the group z has two generators because we could also take minus one as a generator um, so these are the obvious cyclic groups we've seen some non-obvious cyclic groups Um, here, if we take the integers modulo pz and take the non-zero elements under multiplication, this has a generator. Well, um, that's because a generator is the same as what we previously called a primitive root. Um, so, for example, if we take z modulo 7z under multiplication, which has elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, in 6, if we take the element 3 and look at its powers, we get 1, 3, 3 squared, which is um, congruent to 2. Um, then we get 3 cubed, which is congruent to 6. 3 to the 4 is there, and 3 to the 5 is there. So every element is power of 3, and therefore this is a cyclic group. And as we saw, um, it's actually a little bit tricky to prove that these groups are cyclic. And we also saw that z modulo p to the n z star is cyclic for p odd. As usual, the prime p equals 2 goes a bit wrong. Um, we can also say two groups are isomorphic. So if you've got two groups g and h, they, these are called isomorphic if they are really the same. What does that mean? It, it means that, that they become the same if you relabel the um can't spell label if you relabel the elements. And you have to do relabel the elements such in such a way that it still preserves the multiplication or possibly addition. For example, the group Z modulo 7Z star and the group Z modulo 6Z are in fact isomorphic. So what I've got to do is to show that if you relabel the elements of this group and also relabel addition as multiplication, then it becomes the same as this group. So let's see how we do that. Well, here's Z modulo 6Z, and it's got the element 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And here's the element z, here's the group z modulo 7z. And I'm going to map the element 0 to 1 because it has to, because it's the identity. I'm going to map the element 1 to 3, and then 2 to 3 squared, um, which happens to be 2, and then 3 to 3 cubed, which is 6, and 
4 to 3 to the 4, which happens to be 4, and 5 to 3 to the 5, um, um, which happens to be 5 again. So um, here we get 1, 3, 2, 6, 4, 5. So here is how you relabel the elements of this additive group as uh, as elements of multiplicative group and you can see it this is just changing addition to multiplication because um, 3 to the a plus b is equal to 3 to the a times 3 to the b. Um, so although these groups at first sight look quite different you see they're in some sense really the same if, if you just look at them um, as, as, as group theory. Um, there, there's a well-known example you all come across in calculus where if you take the real numbers and the real numbers that are greater than zero, then these two groups are isomorphic because we have the exponential map for relabeling real numbers, and it has an inverse, which is the logarithm map. And you notice that x of a plus b is x of a times x of b. So it re th th this map really is preserving the, 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 the mul multiplication, or rather the it's turning addition into multiplication. <coughs> um, uh, for another example, let's look at the group Z modulo 4Z and the group Z modulo 8Z under multiplication. That's the non-zero elements. So this is elements 1, 3, 5 and 7. And this is element 0, 1, 2 and 3. And just as the groups are, just as we saw the the additive group of order six was isomorphic to the group of non-zero elements modulo seven, we can ask if these two groups are the same. You know, they've got the same number of elements, so it seems plausible that they are the same. And you notice they're not the same because this group has a generator. Obviously, it has a generator one, but these this group doesn't have a generator because if we take um, any one of these elements its square is just one. So this group doesn't have a generator because, you know, if we take five, say, not all elements are powers of five because we only get one and five. So there are actually two quite different groups of order four. So you notice this one has elements that have order four, whereas this one has three elements of order two. Well, what about the group Z modulo 12Z under multiplication? So this also has four elements, one, um, five, seven, and 11. And now these two groups are actually isomorphic because I can give you an isomorphism between them. So I could, for example, obviously have to map one to one, and then I could map three to five and five to seven, and seven to 11. And you can check this actually um, um, preserves the um, multiplication of these two groups. Um, so, so we've got three groups of order four here. This one, this one, and this one, and these two are isomorphic, and this one isn't. Um, next we have Wilson's theorem. which says p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod p, whenever p is a prime. And let me rewrite this in terms of group theory. It says that if g is a finite abelian group, um, then let's take the product of all elements. And the product of all elements is g if there is exactly one element g of order 2 and one otherwise. So um, Wilson's theorem really is a special case of this because if we take g to be the group of non-zero elements under addition, then the then the collection of all elements is 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1. And we notice the product is p minus 1 factorial. So now we need to know how many elements are there of order 2 
Well, this means we're looking at solutions for x squared as congruent to 1 modulo p. And since p is prime, we know that x must be equal to plus 1 or minus 1. So um, that one is order 1, and so there's only one element of order 2. And so the product of all elements, which is p minus 1 factorial, has to be equal to this unique element of order um, 2 by the group theoretic version of Wilson's theorem. So how do we prove the group theoretic elements of Wilson's theorem? Well, let's look at the elements of our group G. So we have an element 1, and we might have an element G, and an, maybe it's got an element that's inverse, and we've got an element H, and the inverse of H, and there might be some element A equal to the inverse of A, and there might be another element B equal to the inverse of B, and so on. And let's take the product. So, well, we've got the element 1, it just gives us 1, and then we've got a pair of elements G and G inverse, and the product of these is just 1, and the product of these is just 1, and so on. So all the elements cancel out, except for the elements equal to their own inverses. So the product of all elements is equal to the product of elements g with g squared equals 1, because otherwise they, um, otherwise um, g is equal to its inverse. So, 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 so this is the condition that says g is actually equal to g to the minus 1, so it doesn't cancel out with its inverse. And now let's work out the product of all elements of, of g with g squared equals 1. Suppose there's only one solution of g squared equals 1. Well, in this case, the product it must be the identity elements. The product is 1. Suppose there are two solutions of g squared equals 1, so that 1 would have to be 1 and 1 would have to be g. So in this case, there's only one element of order 2, and in this case, the product is 1 times g, which is equal to g. Um, now suppose there are more than two solutions of g squared equals 1. So, so let's look. There's 1 and there's g, and there must be an element a, and then there must be an element a times g, so I suppose that, so, so, so the next case is when there are four solutions, and you can easily check that these must all be different if if one g and a are all different. I mean, if a g was equal to a, for example, this would say g would have to be equal to one. And now the product is just equal to one times g times a times a g, which is just equal to one. Um, well, now suppose there's more than four, so there might be another element b. Well, then we can find yet more elements whose square is 1, because there's b and there's bg and there's ba and there's bag. And there might be another element, say c, so we get c, cg, um, ca, cag, and so on. So um, we can group the remaining elements into these clusters of 4, where um, we take some element and we multiply it by these four elements or 1, G, A, and A, G. So if you remember, we were talking about cosets, and these are just cosets of this group. And now if we multiply together all the elements of a coset, we get B to the 4 times G times A times A, G, which is equal to 1, because B squared is 1, and G squared is 1, and A squared equals 1. And similarly, the product of these is equal to 1. So if there are more than four elements, then the elements form clusters of 4 whose product is 1. So we find the product is 1. So this shows the product of all elements of an abelian group is 1, unless there's exactly one element of order 2, in which case the product is that element of order 2. Um, OK, next lecture I'll be giving some applications of products of groups.